Hello everyone, Karnasa here and welcome back to Kerbal Gets Real. We are now in the 1960s and we hopefully have a very exciting decade ahead of us. Now as I said in the last episode, we are going to be changing the formatting of these episodes slightly because quite frankly it's going to be really difficult to fit absolutely everything into a single year. No, we have a lot of launches, we have a lot of interplanetary missions that we hope to be achieving soon, so here is 1960 Part 1. Well, I guess you could already say we've started 1960 Part 1, because in the last episode I released, which was the Artemis LLP build episode, that was indeed at the start of 1960. So go ahead and watch that if you haven't already, because I'm not going to re-show that on this episode, because that would just be, well, a little bit of a waste of time, and I did that in real time. So yeah, go and watch that if you haven't already. But here we have the first launch of 1960. We have Mjolnir 2 on a Heracles 2 launch vehicle on the 16th of January. And you know what? This is going to be potentially the last time we ever launch a Heracles 2 launch vehicle. Because we have upgraded our fleet. We have the new Heracles 60 series of rockets that we will hopefully be using, well, at least for the foreseeable future. Now, Mjolnir 2 is going to be exactly the same as Mjolnir 1. It is the exact same design of spacecraft, except the only difference is this is going to hopefully achieve our first ever Tundra orbit compared to the first ever Molni orbit. The first ever Tundra orbit obviously being a little bit of a trickier orbit to get to, but not by much because a Tundra orbit is a entire side real day, whereas the Molni orbit is only half a side real day. So we need a little bit of extra Delta V to actually achieve the Tundra orbit compared to the Molni orbit. But when I designed the Mjolnir series of rockets, I actually took that into consideration and we had more than enough Delta V in this rocket to actually achieve the Tundra orbit. And there you can see I've got the contract screen up. It is very fiddly, this orbit. It is very tight, but there we go. We have achieved that. And you know what? We have enough Delta V left in that Tundra transfer stage to actually send that transfer stage back crashing down to Earth and clearing up after ourselves. Now the next launch that we're going to have in 1960 is going to be a very exciting one indeed and one that has been a long time coming let me tell you. We do have that contract where we need to set up a constellation of four communication satellites so that is exactly what we are working towards and we have built ourselves a little spacecraft that can actually do it so aptly named comsat constellation one and there we go i did actually finally decide to start training our astronauts in the use of gemini but here we have constellation one on a heracles 60 vii point v on the 29th of march 1960 this is the first launch of this new heracles 60 series of rockets so i am going to show you the entire launch profile of this thing i mean it is pretty much identical to the old heracles 60s not the heracles 60s the heracles 2 launch vehicle that we were using it's four lr89 boosters they are slightly upgraded to the na6 configuration it's got those two lr104 five core stages they have also been upgraded to the na6 configuration and then the upper stage is an x405 engine which is obviously a little bit different what we had before we had another lr105 stage this x405 engine has a little bit better vacuum isp which is really nice it also has three ignitions so on the off chance that we have an ignition failure which can still happen of course hopefully if we are quick enough we can reactivate that engine and get it to fire up before we lose well before we have any ullage problems but we didn't need to do that for this launch that thing went off without a hitch now let's talk about this actual spacecraft i designed this spacecraft in the build episode but i didn't actually show it because like i said in the build episode that would have taken a really long time to show everything so this may be the first time that, well, people are really seeing this. I did kind of show a little bit of a time lapse of this being constructed at the end of that build episode, but it was only very quick. Anyway, the objective of this thing is to achieve that communication satellite constellation. And now what I have done to do this is I have set up a resonant orbit in order to basically put those four individual communication satellites in a perfect 90 degree angle from each other. The way I do this, there is an absolutely fantastic website which you can use to figure out your resonant orbit. And I am going to put a little bit of a picture of that up now. And I will also include a link to this website in the description because it is a truly fantastic resource in order to achieve these resonant orbits. Now, in order to actually set up a constellation with perfect 90 degree angles like I want to do, what you want to do is you want to 
have your spacecraft, your carrier spacecraft in that resonant orbit, then what you want to do whenever you hit, well, when I hit periaps on this, if you are in a dive orbit, when you hit apoaps, you can see that on the actual website. No, what you want to do is you want to release one of the satellites, then you want to circularize your orbit. So I have gone for a 4,000 kilometer orbit with the spacecraft. As soon as you hit that periaps, you circularize that down to 4,000 kilometers in this example. Then what should happen is that spacecraft will then be perfectly placed around 90 degrees, exactly where you want it to be when you release the next satellite at periaps. You do that four times and then you have four satellites all within 90 degrees of each other. And then if you go ahead and try and make the orbital period of each one of those satellites roughly the same. So I think I went for two hours, 55 minutes and a little bit. I can't quite remember the exact amount of milliseconds that I had on that if I'm going to be particularly honest. Well, then hopefully over the course of several years, they shouldn't really shift, which is really nice. So what we can do is we can keep this Constellation Satellite series up for a very long time. And that means we will never, ever, ever run out of communications when we go over the horizon, which is something that I really, really, really want to sort out. I mean, it's OK at the moment, I guess. Mechjeb doesn't actually require communication. So if I've got a maneuver planner and I tell Mechjeb to execute the node, it will still do it. However, it means that you can't stage or you can't do anything like that so it is a lot better to have this constant communication network up and now a future mission that I do want to do regarding communication constellations is I do want to eventually put one of these in geostationary orbit and there's a few reasons for that one because well this thing will eventually go down we will run out of power we are using RTGs but they will eventually run out we can't use them forever and as well geostationary orbit in real solar system is a little bit more difficult to achieve than it is in stock KSP because in stock KSP, you launch from Kerbal Space Center, which has an inclination of pretty much zero. Yes, it is very, very near zero. We're launching from Cape Canaveral, which has an inclination of about 28 degrees. So obviously there is a big inclination change that we're going to have to do. So that is one thing that I would quite like to show on this series is how you actually do achieve those geostationary orbits. Now, one other thing about this mission that I do want to talk about as well is I was having a little bit of a problem with those pro cores. You may have seen earlier on in the video, I lost completely control over all of them and the reason for that is there was a bug with RO tanks. I have since upgraded RO tanks to the latest version and it's not just RO tanks that I've upgraded. No, at the start of 1960 part 2 you will see a lot of differences. I have gone in and updated a rather large amount of mods but I did find a solution to the RO tanks problem. I had to go and I had to rename the satellite. I had to change it from debris to a probe. I then had to go into the tracking station and then I had to come back to the satellite. Obviously, this took a really long time and it was a really roundabout method of actually getting these probes control. However, I am glad that I was able to do that because it meant that I was actually able to successfully complete this contract and actually successfully get my communications network up. It would have been rather sad and a little bit annoying if the only reason why this whole mission, this really quite large and quite long mission, if it would have failed for some silly reason like a bug in the game. There we go, we could actually see I had no control over that satellite there, highlighting exactly what I was talking about. But this is the last of the satellites in this constellation contract and once we have got this in place, that means all four of them should be exactly 90 degrees apart and we should have pretty much constant coverage over the entire world, which is, as I have already said, it is going to be gorgeous. So with that, we have managed to successfully put up our communication satellites and it underwent its shakedown testing and it performed amicably. So we fulfilled the contract, which obviously gave us a lot of money. Now, the next big thing that we're going to be looking forward to is, of course, we have Artemis LLP-1. It is almost complete. There we go. It is now complete. Bleat, and we're going to roll it out to the launch pad, of course, and we're going to go for that very, very major milestone for any space agency, our first lunar landing. And of course, test light is not my friend. So we had a failure. We had an explosion on one of those LR-105 engines, and we also had thrust loss on the other one. So basically, the core stage was completely ruined. So what I decided to do was fly this a little bit of the way and then just rain safety and blow it up.
Now, with that failure, that actually happened to be the last launch of 1960 Part 1, which is a real shame. I always seem to have trouble with the last launches. They never quite go as planned. But oh well, we do have Artemis LLP2 in production, so do not fret. We will be going for the moon once again, and we do want to land on its surface because, hey, there is an awful lot of science to be gained from that and an awful lot of money, but that will have to wait until 1960 Part 2. But before we get to 1960 Part 2, I do believe we have enough time to fit in a vehicle assembly building section of this video, and what we're going to be working on here is going to be Hermes 3. Hermes being our series of rockets that goes into planetary, you may see on Kerbal Alarm Clock, we have there a Mars transfer window in 103 days, and we really want to utilize that. So instead of just making Hermes 3, we're going to be making Hermes 3 and 4 at the same time. The reason for that is, well, the same reason why we made Hermes 1 and 2 at the same time, for redundancy reasons. If Hermes 3 were to fail, we would at least have a backup in Hermes 4 to launch to Mars. Now, Hermes 3 or 4, depending on which one actually makes it, if either of them make it, well, they are going to have a special mission. You may notice on the top of that probe core, we actually have a ScanSat altimetry meter. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and get ourselves in a polar orbit of Mars, in a polar inclination, so that we can scan the entire planet. However, that ScanSat scanner only works up to an altitude of 500 kilometers, which to be quite frank is quite a low orbit. So we're gonna have to really try and squeeze out all of the Delta V in this thing as we possibly can. If the worst comes to the worst, Mars obviously has quite a thin atmosphere. So we could always attempt a little bit of aero braking, but I would rather not have it come to that. So what I have done, we have a hydrazine thruster on that probe core stage, which has about 700 meters per second of Delta V in. Then we're gonna have another hypergolic stage, which is going to be using that Juno 6K engine that I really like, the one with three ignitions. Well, the main reason why I like that is because it uses hydrazine as fuel, so we can just use that hydrazine with our RCS thrusters. It saves on a little bit weight of having extra external hydrazine tanks for that stage. Now, you may have noticed that I have placed a payload fairing on that final core stage. I think we are going to get rid of that just because we really need to squeeze absolutely all of the Delta V that we can out of this rocket in order to achieve that rather low orbit that I've already talked about. So that will probably go, or at least we'll ditch it on the launch. Now, I have been working on the Mars transfer stage, which once again, will be using one of those RL tail engines. They are absolutely fantastic for interplanetary transfers. Obviously, we are using an integral tank there because we want that multi-layer insulation. Obviously, we don't want to suffer from boil-off because this, well, spacecraft may be sitting in Earth orbit for around an hour and a half, probably at the most, depending on where we are when we actually launch this thing. So in order to avoid all of the boil off that we can, we're gonna put that MLI layers on there. And I think I've only gone for about five layers because we don't really need any more of that, any more than that. And it's just kind of unnecessary weight. But there we go. That's pretty much the entire spacecraft finished. Now, just a little bit of fiddling around with the utilization of this spacecraft with the avionics. Of course, that is something that you always have to pay attention to, especially between, well, near Earth and deep space, because <laughs> I have had many a mission fail because I forgot to switch to deep space avionics, which is well, it's quite frankly a really annoying thing and you kind of always hit your head. You're just like, oh my God, I can't believe I forgot to do that. That is really quite annoying. But there we go. That is the spacecraft done. And of course, we are going to be attaching a Hermes VII.V, point V, <laughs> the, well, launch vehicle that I designed last episode. Well, in the launch vehicle I designed that you didn't actually see and that I really like calling it by the actual letters rather than the 7.5 that it really is. But with all of that done, it's just a little bit of checking our staging to make sure that everything is okay. And one final little addition, well, edit that I made to the probe core was I actually made the RCS thrusters on that final stage a bit bigger because the symmetry of that stage is all kind of weird because it's got parts hanging off in all different directions so in order to really retain control of that thing I wanted to make those well a little bit bigger than they were already.
But there we have it, that was the end of 1960 part one. I hope you have enjoyed this episode. If you have enjoyed this episode, why not go and give it a like? If you have really enjoyed this episode and would like to continue with the content on my channel, please do subscribe. I have been Karnasa, and I will see you later.